Okay, well, greetings and welcome to today's educational program. Managerial Engineering, Designing Future Firms by Dr. Gregory H. Watson. This is your moderator, Doug Wood, with the ASQ's Quality Management Division. So today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Dr. Gregory H. Watson. I want you to join me in welcoming him. Dr. Watson has degrees in uh, management, law, and industrial engineering. He's an 18-year ASQ fellow and past chair in the year 2000. He received the ASQ Distinguished Service Medal, plus the Lancaster, Crosby, and Ishikawa Medals. He's been named an honorary member by 17 national quality associations. Dr. Watson uh, delivered speeches to more than 20 ASQ national and divisional conferences. A former quality executive with Hewlett Packard, Compaq Computer, and Xerox. And he has coached executives in quality transformations at Nokia Mobile Phones, uh, Toshiba, ExxonMobil, and over 20 other companies. He's the only Westerner to have awarded a Deming Medal by the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, the W. Edwards Deming Award for Dissemination and Promotion Overseas in 2009. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gregory H. Watson. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doug. Tonight we're going to talk about managerial engineering. And, and when we talk about this, I'm just seeing my computer is frozen. Interesting. Can you, ah, okay. There it goes. Okay. It's going now. Okay. So we're going to talk about management and engineering. And, and uh, we're going to be talking about what does it take to actually engineer the management of an end-to-end -end working system. And, and I want to begin by describing what I mean by managerial engineering. So in the past, we have engineered things for process control. We want to keep them in a state of control. But now things are moving so fast with digital technologies and changes happening in uh, many different realms that what we're thinking about is we need to be designing systems so they support ongoing change. So managerial engineering, it's an emerging field in, in industrial engineering, and it talks about building the interrelationships between operationally based uh, function, uh, pr process organizations and project-based organizations that will actually change that engineering of those operational processes. And so the whole business then is linked into an aligned system of systems. So this methodology is focusing on organizational design, and it, it's shifting from functional bureaucratic uh, silos, if you will, of a classical uh, functional organization into a network of cross-functional business processes that are, are, are working together. So this is a, a high-level uh, business analysis type of ac activity, and it's using cross-disciplinary engineering knowledge, and these people will act as internal consultants to design, develop, and deploy more efficient, cost-effective processes. So they're working as coaches in the organization and as trusted advisors to management. Now that might seem a lot to you like it's just like quality. And I think in many instances, this is quality under another name. And so we talk about the three Gemba organization, which we've described in the past. And we see at each of these levels, we're doing something slightly different, but they're all change. At the work process, we have continual improvement. At the middle cross-functional level, we do breakthrough projects. And at the governance level, our total corporate level, we're investing in transformations. And so what we need to do is design quality into each level of this productive system so that it's going to be able to produce the outcomes that we're looking for in both goods and services. Now, the critical success factors in managerial design are we have to understand the requirements. And that means we have to understand the key process indicators, what are the deliverables, and also what is the customer testing and measurement system that they'll evaluate us with. We also have to understand the quality characteristics of what is being delivered to the customers. And we can think of this in terms of the Kano model. So we're designing effective systems. That's must be quality. We have to have customer intimacy. That's this one dimensional quality. And we need to create a competitive edge and that's this attractive quality that motivates customers to want to be engaged with us. And then we also have to pursue the delivery of customer value. And so we have to understand what is the job customer needs to perform with the deliverables that we're providing them, whether they're services or products. What's the tolerance limit they have for their performance needs? And what is their resource availability and scheduling to work with us? 
So we have to develop, discover then profound knowledge in all of those dimensions. When we look at the Kano model, we see it's, it's very familiar. Uh, I, I've changed the labels here a little bit. So we see at this top end, we're talking about attractive quality, Miro Kuteki Hinshitsu. And that means that those are unspoken quality characteristics. The customer doesn't really know what they are. They're latent, they're hidden from them. In the middle, what's this one dimensional I call competitive quality? Because this is what the customer can talk about. It's typically what comes out in a request for proposal or request for quotation. And they can list all of the requirements they have, and then they evaluate the different offerings that they get to see what is the highest performing and what is the best value. And, and the best value for price, uh, performance for price actually wins. The third is, is commodity quality. It never actually gets into a high level of satisfaction. But this is must be. If it doesn't exist, you haven't delivered a product uh, at all. And, and this is uh, Aram, uh, uh, Atari Mei Hinshitsu. It's unspoken quality characteristics. These are the things that must be there. It, it's like if you're driving a car. There has to be some way to steer the car. There has to be some way to stop it. If you don't have those things, you've missed the essence of a car. So when we're looking at an organization, we think using these three dimensions. And, and basically from an executive level, what we're doing is we're managing resource flows in that organization. And the job is to revitalize performance, keep the performance living as a living organism, if you will. And so the executives monitor strategy, they do a strategy assessment, they search for new strategies, they'll formulate a strategy, and those are projects to change the, the working environment, and then they'll implement those projects, and then again, they'll monitor those, those strategies, see how well they're doing in implementation. If we take a look at this, we see there are really three systems operating here. There's a management system in what I call Gemba 1, that's in the, this work level. There's a leadership system that's in this Gemba 2, and that's the, the combination of managers and business leaders. And then those business leaders also are working with the board of directors in a governance system. And that's what we call Gemba 3. Duran called this upper half big Q or big quality and the lower half little Q. And so we can think of those as strategic quality and operational quality. And what we see is at the very top, we're asking questions like why? Why are we here as an organization? What is our purposeful intent? When we're talking about this middle section, the leadership, we're trying to develop a strategy. What do we need to do? When do we need to do it? And that's what we have the planning function. In the daily management system, we're saying, where do we need to do this? How do we do it? And for both of those, we're focusing on how much, but we're asking the question with two different measurement systems. In the operational world, we're using time-based measurement systems or quality-based measurement systems or monetary systems but in the set strategy level, we're really only asking about productivity and profitable growth. And so we're going to have different languages happening throughout this whole thing as we're trying to understand what are those questions we need to address in the organization. Now, if we think of this in terms of a strategic planning process, we see the executive function is dealing with the strategy assessment. They, they do benchmarks externally. They evaluate their capacity. What are the resources we have? And then they take a look at where are we today? What are the challenges we have? Then they have to go search. What are the things we could do about those challenges? And so they see we have opportunities and vulnerabilities. And from that, they have to make choices. That's strategy formulation. And out of that, they will choose projects that will change through the strategy implementation, the way the daily management system works. And then those targets from strategy formulation go to the strategy monitor so they can say, are we actually delivering the results that we need to? And then finally, management review of the current capabilities gives us the feedback loop back into the strategy component. So strategy assessment, search, and formulation are all jobs of managerial engineering. And what we start seeing is there's some core capabilities for activities in this Gamba 3 environment. So we see the very first component of this is we had to do a performance analysis of our processes. So we do a process audit. What do the numbers tell us we're actually doing? We also take a look at business performance indicators. What does that tell us? So we're going to take a look at operational measures and, and business measures, and together we will have an internal perspective in terms of what is our organization's performance actually doing. Next, 
next, we take an external perspective. And here, we're going to do something like strategic benchmarking. What do we need to do differently as an organization? We'll take a look at technology assessment. Which technologies are coming along well enough that they could be incorporated in our process? And then we're going to blend these together with the critical assumptions we made about our business model and, and uh, also what are the constraints we have on the organization, either from resources or uh, some other past decisions we've made. And we will uh, combine those with our strategic decision criteria to create the set of strategic change projects. This is our portfolio of change projects. Essentially, what we've done is this is the same process that we go through in what's called Hoshin Conry. In Hoshin Conry, we're going to select three to five major change efforts for the whole organization that are sponsored by the executive team. And this is the kind of structure that we would go through to choose that set of strategic change projects. Now, this all came out of actually the same idea that Schuhart had when he talked about this in his 1939 book uh, uh, about uh, um, quality as a means, I mean, strat excuse me, statistics as a means of, of understanding. And he, he presented his cycle. And so he says we have specification, production, and inspection. And, and that is following what, what was called in the industrial engineering plan, do, see. And, and uh, that C came into effect because of the, the thinking of Frederick Taylor, adding inspectors to the workers uh, who are doers and, and the managers who are the planners. So, so this was this efficiency movement that was coming on, adding this new function. But we see that's not enough. That's insufficient. And the Japanese have this idea of plan, do, check, act. And, and uh, Dr. Kano made this humorous statement. He said, too many managers are do act managers. And that's exactly what they get, do do. You know, if we don't have plan, if we don't have a checking in this process, we are actually not going to be able to run this cycle for continual improvement. So Peter Drucker said, plans are only good intentions unless they immediately degenerate into hard work. So excellence is in the execution. We have to have the planning and we have to have the execution. So in the Japanese uh, daily management system, they have these two cycles operating together, the daily management, standardized do, check, act, and then the change management, which is plan, do, check, act. And, and they rotate between back and forth between that check step. For management, the check step is also where they do study. So when Deming talks about plan, do, study, act, he's actually talking about a transformation process, not the SDCA, PDCA loop, but a different cycle which is embedded on top. So I'm showing that as study is what the, the management does when they're doing this managerial engineering function. And they're trying to find out, is this whole system that we have doing standardized do check act, plan do check act, is it actually driving the performance we need to have for the organization? Will it fulfill our purposeful objective? And what we see in Gemba 1, we see this is the process of uh, working and improving that work. So we do our work, and then we improve our work. And, and that's the job of Gimbal One. So we have team activities, and we're leading those teams. We have uh, work review. We identify waste. We have team action. We're trying to balance flow and, and balance productivity in that process. So we have this incremental Kaizen activity happening in the standardized do, check, act process. And then we have project-based Kaizen activity happening in the PDCA process. And so what's uh, new for many people is that they haven't seen the standardized do check act process. And I think this is an eye opener as we start thinking about this because most people think about standardized in terms of 5S, where they think that's the fourth S. And I'm gonna address that in just a little bit. So if we need to understand standard work, what we mean is this is the most efficient method to produce a deliverable that meets the quality requirements. And it breaks works into the sequential elements, checklists, if you will, steps that we're going to follow to go and do the things that we need to, to produce the outcomes that we want in a state of control. And so the workers have to be trained in those tasks. They're given the tools, methods, equipment. They're given decision rights to regulate their performance so that they can make their targets. Then, then they're maintained in terms of the current requirements in terms of what they have to produce to. And so this is what is happening in the role of standard work. Now, when we take a look, process owners are managing this overall cycle. 
they look down on the process and they say, in daily management, we're managing process flow efficiency. In this change management cycle, what we're actually doing is we're managing resource efficiency. In other words, we apply additional resources where they're needed to the daily management system. So Gemba One, the workplace, is doing the daily work using those work processes. Gemba Two is doing strategic work, allocating resources that will encourage this higher productivity in terms of the workplace. So we can think about this standardized do check act as a process. So we arrange all work activities into a set of standard ways of working. We perform them. We evaluate the work against standards for compliance, and then we adjust uh, our work activities if there's a shortfall or we improve the standard way of working. And we keep applying that cycle process uh, in our work management process on a continual basis. Now, in 5S, the last two S's are called Siketsu and Chitsuke. So Siketsu actually means in, in the kanji purification. It, it, it's the two kan uh, kanji terms. C actually means pure, and Ketsu is a medical term. It's the antiseptic cleaning. And that's actually a part of, of not the daily management cycle. It's actually a part of total productive maintenance. It's the first step in total productive maintenance. Shiketsu, uh, it, it doesn't mean sustain. It means teaching manners or living according to the rules or following the way with discipline. So I've been trying to think, how do I explain this in a little better way? Most people just say, oh, follow the five S's blindly. And that's not what we do in Japan. So if we take a look at one day's work in Japan. It begins here to see time. That means at the beginning of the day, we get our work in order and we get ready to go and do what we need to do. That's the beginning of every day. That's what every teacher in Japan tells the students to start the day. Siri Sitan, get your books out, get ready, we'll start our lessons. And then we go through the day and here we're following the SDCA approach. So we're doing the work, we spend 80% of the time, we check, we adjust, and we re-standardize. And at the end of the day, we do SISU. SISU is the rough cleaning, and it's going to be getting us to the point where we get rid of all of the waste that's accumulated in the day, and we get the, the organization back into order at the start of the day. Now, at the end of the day, we will do some form of siketsu. And siketsu here is this deeper cleaning, and this is the type of cleaning that happens under the label of autonomous maintenance. So this is what the worker would do in their daily work activity. So the eight-hour workday is Siri Sitan, SDCA, Sisu. And then they have another period of time, because they have a 10-hour workday in Japan, which is Siketsu. And Siketsu is either some cleaning that they do, or it's training or some other activities in their process. So we start seeing that this productive time is divided into three categories. And this occurs on a needed basis in terms of Siketsu. So every day they will have different activities. Some activities will be required every day, and then other activities will happen on a regular scheduled basis. So what this looks like in each day, we see so three S, so CFD, Sitan, and, and, and uh, Sisu, and then different Siketsu operations. At the end of the week, we start seeing this workplace management discipline. This is constancy of purpose. We're always doing the same things. At the fourth S, this is the rest of TPM, we fit that in as needed. And that might be done by the maintenance crew or what's not done by the operators. And then the, the, this is coordinating all of those daily team activities. So the fifth S is about standardized do check act. And, and this is, is about sustaining the performance across the whole process. And so we start seeing that we have to integrate 5S with SDCA. That's the challenge. This is one reason why I believe 5S doesn't work in so many organizations. We can get the 3S done because that's the logical process that they follow in almost every organization in Japan, and that's called daily housekeeping. But when we get to the 4S and the 5S, it's actually a different place, and it came out of two different places in Japan. So remember, th the 5S did not come out of the quality community at all. SDCA came out of the quality community. 5S came out of the factory management uh, or associations of Japan. So that came out of the same people that brought us TPM. So there's two different ways of working and there's two different groups applying it in Japan. And so we have to figure out how do we actually bring those two tools so that they're working together in harmony. 
And so this is this second step in a Kaizen journey. And we shouldn't try to go on the impossible journey like this Ecker sketch. And, and so we have to understand where we are, and that's just the beginning. So, so it's essential that the path to our destination be planned. So we have to transition from daily work to these other activities that will transform the organization to what we want to be in the future. Now, there are three gifts that we have as management to give workers. Paichi Ano said, when you go to the Gemba, ask what you can do for them. Do not go to scold them. That's not the way of Kaizen. So the three gifts management has to give them. One is direct responsibility. Do they have the decision rights? Do they know what they can do within defined boundaries? And do they have an agreed upon schedule for what they should be doing and when they should be doing it? The second is dedicated resources. Do they have the methods, tools, training to do the job they need to do? And the third is decision rights. Have we given them the authority to make decisions in their area of responsibility, including committing budgeted funds or assigning uh, work to people who are on their team that are participants. So we have to make sure that we follow through with those sorts of things. So this is this three components of the organization we talked about previously. Strategic direction, change management, daily management. And they're all going to happen differently at different levels. So leadership is looking to see where do we go over the long term. And that's talking about getting the rational decisions of the process right, setting the right strategy. Cross-functional work is distributing resources and decision rights so the business system will uh, operate smoothly. The operational level is actually doing the value-adding work. And so improvement uh, projects can happen at all three of those levels of the organization, but they're going to have a different type of scope and a different type of uh, objective. Now, we see that all change happens one project at a time. And change implies that there's some base state from which movement is occurring. Kaizen literally means change for the better. It's this desired direction that we would like to go in the future. So do we want to accept chaos as the original state? Or would we like some degree of stability so we can actually have a stronger foundation to make change happen and to predict the future? Dur Duran made this comment. He says, without a standard, there can be no improvement. So if we don't have a standard, the first thing we should do is work to get one. So what's the base from which our change is going to begin? So we have to eliminate chaos as the very first step. And that is the very first step towards beginning towards the Kaizen approach. So we've talked about this model before. The very first time we approach this, we're going to follow the SDCA cycle. We turn the wheel, if you will, and the objective is just to understand. And so we're focusing on operational quality. Next time, after we understand it, now we can actually think about documenting it. And after we've documented it, now we can see where the waste is, where the losses are, where we have constraints, and we can simplify that system. And we've gone through those three steps. We should have our standard work developed so we can then move into uh, exercising strategic quality types of things. And, and we start seeing that these learning levels are going through three levels of, of control. When we first understand we're in this out of control state, when we can get the process documenting, we're having people doing similar things. So we've actually created some stabilization in the process. And when we simplify it, we're eliminating the waste activity. So we're actually moving it up to a third level. So we see that there are these cycles of learning, which we talked about in our last lecture. And, and they all occur as we focus on how the teams are going to work in the processes to make the change happen. Now, Taichi Ono in Workplace Management said, this is, I think, a very important comment he made. He says, impressive standard work is never absolute in its practice. He says, first, pick a starting point that fits you the best and create a solid foundation, which will help to gather useful clues for establishing a more desirable and attainable achievement of standard work. Do not aim for perfection create a lenient standard to, of work to begin with. I think many people, when they start saying out, we have to get the most perfect thing, let's document the perfect process, even though we're not doing it. So he's saying, document what you do, make it lenient, make it easy, and then keep improving it. And he says, that's what Kaizen is. So the most, most important thing is get a base and then start improving from there. The second most important thing is continue improving. The third most important thing is think then, how do we challenge perfection? How do we keep working to get this done and get it done better? 
And this is what Dr. Duran called the great unfinished work of managing for quality. So just like scientific knowledge, standard work is never settled. It's never fixed and rigid. It always needs to be open to new discoveries and finding better ways to do things and better ways to understand what we must do. As Duran said, all change occurs one project at a time and in no other way. So opportunities for improvement need to be consolidated and sequenced in priority of need using an assessment of what is the impact they have on the business system. The portfolio of change projects should be used to identify where are we going to apply our resources and what are going to be the priorities for us to use those resources to create uh, correct these observed uh, deficiencies. And the improvement projects uh, need to be selected so we get the system-based perspective of well, how do we increase the total value of what the organization is doing. Now, I'm going to go into this, the second part of this, this presentation, which is talking about the process of management and how do we guide this. And, and Parker always said some very <laughs> basic things, which I, I always like his, his, his words. He says, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. So we have to focus, focus, are we actually doing the things we need to do? So why does quality manage manner in designing a process of management? Well, we see we need to identify and eliminate mood of waste from the sources. We need to understand and streamline the flow, find and reduce special causes of variation, improve safe operating conditions for workers, reduce transaction costs in the process activities, foolproof the operating tasks so we eliminate inadvertent errors, and accept quality assurance responsibility at each point of work to make sure we do the job right, and then pursue perfection in achieving work capacity and capability. So the importance of collaboration is, is seen here. Drucker said management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. And he said, effective work is done in and by teams of people with diverse knowledge and skills. These people have to work together voluntarily and according to the logic of the situation and demands of the task, rather than according to formal jurisdictional structure. In other words, the org chart doesn't tell you what to do. It's our informal ways of working. That's the most important. And as I say, a fundamental right thing is working together. It's building up this participative environment so we know and can trust what our colleagues are doing. So becoming a successful internal consultant, this role of this managerial engineer, we are a trusted advisor and also a business analyst. So the internal consultant doesn't predict the future. Their job is to affect the future, to become the cause uh, that is behind the change. So a great internal consultant recognizes problems before they become emergencies and has a solution ready before managers know the problem exists. So great internal consultants have to be curious about what's happening, skeptical about the data. They anticipate situations that have already, that they have already considered as what if scenarios. So they have valuable insights into what could happen as well as what the unintended consequences of actions taken in those circumstances. So we're gonna talk about the process of management. And Plan Do Check Act is the basis for the process of management. So workers follow the SDCA, that's the daily management system. Supervisors and managers follow PDCA, and they're trying to figure out what do we need to do to make this process more effective. And, and the process acts in concert with SDCA to provide resources that enables a daily work. So use of PDCA in the process of management was first developed at Hewlett Packard in the late 1980s, 1987, and it's still being applied in the company. And, and I was in that team that, that developed this back at that point in time. And so I'm gonna talk the rest of this session about this class, process of management and, and for you to use it as a benchmark. So here's the process of management. There's five steps and then a, a recycle or a feedback loop. So we establish a common purpose, build shared objectives, develop an integrated plan, lead the local action, evaluate results and process, and then loop back with the lessons learned for continual improvement. And what we see is this process of management is distinct from the content. So, so what is flowing through here? It may be strategy, it may be tactics, it may be products. It's also distinct from the analytical tools. 
So it's basically how do I actually get the people to work together? And we see that this can be done at all levels of the organization. And that's exactly how it was applied at Hewlett Packard. It's the entry level management process. I was talking in China and I, I mentioned Palm and I had one young lady come up to me and she said, she introduced herself and she said, I'm the Palm teacher for China. Hewlett Packard still using this. This is about five years ago. And so we see if we decompose Palm into actionable steps, we see one job of leadership is to find and then fund the future of the organization. They have to achieve this long-term vision and, and the goals by doing this evaluating work. And those changes have to be planned as a portfolio improvement projects to shift performance. So what changes needed for the future? Once we have that, we assign it to a team and to the team with the team leader will execute this process of management. What are we going to do in our team to improve? What are our objectives? What's the plan? How will we do it? And then we go do the work. At the end, we evaluate the results in the process. So what do each of these steps actually mean? So I'm going to take them through one step at a time and walk you through this pretty quickly, I guess. So step one, we're thinking about purposeful behavior. So communicate with the customers, study the environment, align with organizational objectives, be willing to innovate analyze and integrate data. And so there's a detailed description here. So what we want to do is we need to challenge our legacy, our same old uh, uh, same old way of working and ask what if, and, and what are the positives that we can apply that will innovate in this process? We experiment with different types of technologies here to understand how could we do things differently? How can we change the purpose? Now, I want to uh, use this idea here called the the constructor law. So the constructor law is talking about purposeful systems. And this was a, a, a theory that was brought out by Adrian Bijan. Um, I actually like it quite a bit in his book, Design and Nature. And he says, flow systems have two features. There's content flowing through them like a current, and there's a design through which it flows. So, so for us, products flow through processes, and that's the same idea of his flow management. So the constructor law says that these systems de evolve over time so that their flow becomes more productive. And, and that means that there's both a structural change as well as the pulse or cadence which flows through there. That's like the talk time or the beat in a production process. When the system flows better, then it's healthier. And there are two different types of flow systems. One is a river model. It's a one-way flow. And that's sort of dictatorial. It's a command, do it my way. This is the only way. If you're downstream, you suffer. So, so I was reading about a dam in China that uh, they had to blow because there was too much flooding. And so the river's only going to flow one way. You can't reverse the flow of the, the river. However, if you take a look at the human body, we have lungs. Lungs are a two-way flow. We breathe in, we breathe out. There's a give and take in the system. And that's more purposeful behavior. And that's a participative thing. So I'm doing something with the flows, and there's a process actually happening. So our question here is, how do you establish the aim or the purpose that's going to shape the path for your project team? Second step is about visionary behaviors. So what are the common values we have? How do we share our way of working? What is the vision we have? Are we all looking at the same vision? How do we involve people in building the vision and getting them to accept that vision of what needs to be done? And then how do we maintain alignment to the vision and then measure performance against the vision? A vision without a measure is not a vision. It's just a wish or the best good intention. So again, we start seeing here with the detailed description that what we're trying to do is, is align the process team so that there's a mutually respectful way of working. This is, is becoming a coherent group. So we encourage team discussion, agreement, and we work together to understand to how all the team members communicate so we understand. And so process leaders describe opportunities so everyone can understand their roles, and then the leaders have to test to make sure everybody in the team really does agree and, and that, that we're all going to be working together towards those same objectives. And again, we see the construct the law, and we, we see the same, so this is just repeating that top uh, comment again, but visionary behaviors. We see there's two behaviors here. We can have a close view of future processes that gives us possibilities. This gives us profound knowledge because we can think about what's happening. So we take a detailed look at what could be happening in the future. 
or we can gain perspective of current activities. And that's where we take a distant view of current activities. And, and we do this because we need to get away and get some perspective. Otherwise, we can't see it because we're too lost in the details. So our question is, how do we see differently about the possibilities of the future as well as the present? And then the third stage is about planning behaviors. And here we see we have effective planning techniques we'd like to put in place. So we have to identify what are the resources? Uh, wh how do we share responsibility and make sure that people can work together in this environment for responsibility? How do we manage the resource flow? And how do we assess and evaluate progress? So again, we see here we, we have to define what are our critical performance? What are the critical few objectives we have? What are the performance indicators? How we collect the data? How are we going to involve the team? And how do we get people to work together? And how do we negotiate agreements so we all know that we're doing the things that are considered valuable by the whole team? So again, we come back to this planning behaviors, and we start seeing these, these activities have to avoid two conditions. One is management myopia. And this is when we're taking such a close view of the, the things that we're doing, we enter into the sin of micromanagement. And so management is looking too much at the detail of the work. The other sin is management hyperopia. And that's when management can't see what's happening in the distance. And here we start seeing, we get confused and we, we get so caught up, we can't actually understand what the future is or how it could be going. And here we see this is the sin of distraction. So how do we integrate the available resources, capabilities, and competencies into the plan that we have for change in our organization? The fourth stage we see is about leadership behaviors. Now this is lead the action. So here we see the team is gonna go do the change and the job of the, the team leader is going to be to facilitate the action, review the progress, gain and get uh, feedback from everybody, support the people so they feel encouraged, lead by example, and then recognize and reward the contributions. Uh, so that can be just as simple as saying, that's a good job that you just did. So here we see each of these activities, and, and I think what's most important is the practices Hewlett Packard put in place, management by wandering around. Uh, that was what Taiichi Ono took you on board. And he said, I learned about this when I created the Gemba Walk. So the Gemba Walk actually was created, and he said he learned about it from Tom Peters' book, In Search of Excellence. And, and where Peters learned about it from was from Hewlett Packard in Silicon Valley when he went to visit there. And we start seeing is the, the things we have to do, this comes with being an excellent manager. We have to allow people to learn from their own mistakes. We have to communicate in an honest way. And, and we have to behave in a way that's authentic. That means that our words and our actions are consistent so that we're not saying one thing and then doing something different. And so here we start seeing this harmonization of technology. So there's some, some basic, some leadership behaviors we see here. So we start seeing that leadership tends to exercise authority in one of two extremes. So there's either dictatorial management, and this is where they over-specify what you must do and leaves no freedom for the workers, or there's participative management, where I give you a performance specification and say, I'm going to leave it up to you, and there's very broad discretion. And what we start seeing is that we need actually something in between. That's what William o Uchi uh, called a theory Z instead of theory X and theory Y. The fifth stage of this is, is about evaluation behaviors. So here we see at the end of the day, we're getting done, we have to figure out, did we really satisfy the customer? Did we really satisfy the organization? Did we achieve and did the customer get what they're looking for? We have to review our process and the results, not just the results. And we have to identify what can we do better and then also celebrate success. <clears throat> and again here, we're gonna collect data and feedback about the communications. We'll just you know go do through a, the CSI post-mortem, okay, the project is dead, it's, it's been put aside. Now, what caused it to die? What caused it to live so well? Why did it live so long or so, so healthily? And then we ask the team, you know, how can we improve our effectiveness and the way we work together as a team? And so again, here we see that there's two evaluation behaviors in a post-mortem. One is recognizing successful people. And we see that, that many times, recognition systems by managers tend to cherry pick 
those who are the most visual. Uh, so so the, the most visible person, they may never actually get to understand who the true significant contributors were. If we recognize successful teams, then management is recognizing the full team, and that's reinforcing the concept of collaboration, participation, and consensus. So how do we actually evaluate you know, this, this success and uh, the satisfaction in, as well as uh, success in terms of the results that are produced? So we have to think about what is the best way to build that process uh, up for the organization. And finally, the last step is this renewal. So as I said before, in the past, management engineers have been uh, uh, designing uh, business systems for control. Now we have to think, how do we support this continuous flux of change? This is why the process of management is so important. Because once we have a project identified, we can execute, execute the process of management to go do that process. So this is not competing with DMAIC. DMAIC is a series of steps we use for analyzing. It's a different mental model. They actually can coexist. And so we see that this shift is, is saying we need to change then from a functional organization to some sort of end-to-end -end business. So we see how do we put that system together? And management engineers are going to be the ones who are the internal consultants working between and across all levels to develop this. We'll start seeing more and more work will be done at the front end of business process design. And that this is going to be where the focus of that we end up having in most of our organizations. So now the real work of quality become, begins. So we start off with an issue, something that we feel like we needed to work on. We turn that into a problem. That's something that we can go and solve. We turn the problem into a project. This is going to be how we do it. And then that project produces results. So excellence is only coming by execution. That's how we make the change happen. Aristotle said, we are what we related, uh, relatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but it's a habit. I think that's supposed to be repeatedly do. Excellence is never an accident. It's always a result of high intention, severe, uh, sincere effort, intelligent execution, and it represents the wise choice of many alternatives. Choice, not chance, determines your destiny. The only good project then is a done project. It's executed. It's not that you completed the last step of DMAIC. It's that it was implemented and it delivered the value. So projects are not done until they're proven during implementation. And implementation is what uncovers the unintended consequences, the changes we hadn't thought about. And unintended consequences, they signal that we had poor understanding of the problem in the first place. And poor understanding came from insufficient reflection. So one thing I've, I've been talking about throughout these lectures is the need for having time to reflect. And that's really what happens in that plan do check step or the standardized do check step. That's the reflection time or the pause where we need to think about things. So managerial engineering of the business system, it builds on quality management. We have to have that foundation. We have to have quality development where we're designing a system. We also have to have a culture. How do the people work together? And through all of that, we build up what's called leadership through quality. So this is this combined effect where the whole system comes together. And it, we are not doing scientific management anymore. We're actually doing what you might call scientific leadership. So I have a, a little uh, inspirational comment. He who has 100 miles to walk should think 90 miles is half the journey, so that when we think we've almost gotten there, we really have just, you know, sort of uh, found out now there's a whole much further way to go because we had no idea how long the journey really was when we started out. So just a couple of takeaway lessons to confirm. So how will you manage? So managerial engineering is providing technical assistance for the conduct of strategic management. It enables objectively based analysis to support executive judgment in choosing the, the set of strategic improvement projects to pursue. So it can indeed support Hoshin Conry. It can indeed, indeed be done by senior quality people in an organization. And we've looked at three learning objectives. One was to discover the relationship between strategy management and, in, and managerial engineering, to understand how SDCA, PDCA cycles relate 
to projects for driving change in an organization to reach strategic ends, and learn how the process of management operates in conjunction with the SDCA, PDCA operational activities. And so now I see that we've, we've reached the end of the PowerPoint slides. We have uh, almost 15 minutes, I think, uh, for us to take a look at some questions, or 11 minutes. Um, so, Doug, how are we doing on questions? Oh, well, I've been watching here pretty steady. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, so Peter asks this. He says, uh, there's so much to think about. Uh, the point was made that a great internal consultant as a solution ready before the managers know that the problem exists. So how do you convince management to take action when they don't even know that there's a problem? <laughs> well, I'll tell you a story. Uh, I consulted Nokia mobile phones for five years to the CEO. And, and my job was uh, the, the um, statement of work for my consulting contract. It was a quote from the Cal of La Caru. And it said, keep the magic going. And the magic was double-digit profitability, profitable growth uh, over the whole period of time. During that five years, we grew 86% compound annual growth rate in unit shipments. And what that meant was I could be pretty well guaranteed that what we're doing today won't work nine months from now. So what we have to do is we have to figure out where will our process break. And so we had to engineer the business as a system, understand the process flows, understand the weaknesses, and what were the the key points where we had to monitor it and figure out what we actually do. And so that means we had to be good managerial engineers. And, and if you do that, then you know ahead of time what will break and what's going to happen. Where is the weak spot in the system? We might not be able to anticipate exactly when it will break, but we can start thinking about how will I fix this? What are the scenarios? What if? What would I do if this happens and so forth? Now, the way you get management to believe in you is to perform that's the only way and, and so we have to they have to be able to see that we indeed can create that crystal ball from the data that we have and say here's where it's building here's what we're dealing with now now many organizations like in a chemistry uh, factory or an oil refinery they have flow meters they have all these sorts of things that's exactly what they do in their control room well how do we take that same logic and apply it into any type of business and that means that, that we have to become that process controller with the data and the systems together. And that's one of the things I think that, that quality 4.0, this whole digitization of organizations, is going to bring us to. Because that's exactly what, what those uh, artificial intelligence systems or pattern recognition rule-based systems, those are, are there to try to identify and get advanced understanding of those things. But, but basically, we need people to be able to figure out those processes. It's not just algorithms. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, a couple other questions come up here. Um, let me see if we get these in some kind of an order. Okay. So, uh, one question was kind of basic. It says, sorry for this confusion. So, daily management also includes cross-functional management? Cross-functional managers have daily activities, but by daily management, we mean the daily work that you're doing anywhere in the organization. Maybe you're processing sales orders. Maybe you're, you're ordering parts. Maybe you're building things. Maybe you're ser providing service. So it's the actual point of delivery is that daily management level of the organization. Cross-functional management is managing the flows between those daily units. And so... That cross-functional management may, may say, hey, I've got a flow from a factory. It's coming from a supply chain. So I have supplier quality stuff. I have parts flow, materials management things. I've got distribution systems going out there. I've got an order processing system. Those are cross-functional flows. And so there's, this is the, the difference between the two. Okay. Um Here's, here's a paradigm question. The person uses the word paradigm. Uh, a lot of things to improve and improve. Uh, the normal, he sees, is to have, you know, the perfect standard work. But how do you break the paradigm of, of the standard? Um, I, I think the first thing is that never, never think you're going to have a perfect standard work. 
you know, Taichi Ono's comment was was just standardize something. And, and when you do that, then challenge people to make it better. As a matter of fact, he, he went on in his statement and he said that it's better it's it's not so good because then workers can easily start making the first sort of improvements. And then you can use that to reinforce you're doing a good job, you're making it better. And they get into the habit of looking for things to improve. And, and, and so he said, you're best off if your first standard is actually pretty lenient, he called it. And, and I think this is the, the important thing. Many times in organizations, we've taken a more Western view of this where we say, here is the standard, it's got to be done this way. And it becomes a fixed checklist. Well, that's a rigid approach. That, that's, uh, if you will, a bureaucratic approach. And, and, and standard work is not, should not be that way. People should not perceive it as that way because then they're going to hate it. And, and, and they won't, won't want to do it. They'll say, I have a better way to do it. And if you don't call my work standard, I'm going to do it my own way. And the next thing you have, you have a whole bunch of rebels who want to go do their own thing. And, and, and I think what we have to do is say, you know, we have an opportunity for all of us to come together and have this best way of doing things. But we have to allow freedom and independence to act within that standard. So what is standard and where do we allow independence to work? And, and that's, that's, um, that is the art of supervision, if you will, where, where you can understand that each person brings to that job a different perspective, a different capability, skill level, and so forth. And, and they can only do what they, they've got to do. You can't force everybody to be the super person. And I think this was a mistake that Frederick Taylor made in, in principal scientific management. He was only looking for what he called the first class man. And, and if you weren't the first class man, you know, uh, this, this, uh, uh, tender swipe right. <laughs> That's what he do. Swipe your right off the, the, you know, thing. I'm only looking for first class man. You're not it. You're gone. Uh, and, and then as soon as that person got tired, you're no longer a first class man. You're gone. And so he treated people as a pair of hands. And, and what we have to do is, is in, in this process of developing standards the way the Japanese are, the people are not just a pair of hands. They're a pair of hands and a head. So it's the mind and the hand working together. Good answer. Uh, I, I, it's a good read to read Frederick Taylor's uh, original paper, but you still <laughs> have to keep. You got to keep in mind when he was operating. It, it was yeah. not the world we live in today. Uh, systems were not as complex. Okay. Um, so here's here's a question. It goes into uh, what's a good delivery method for these kinds of messages if a company is just used to changing processes, but not really measuring anything. The only measure that seems to matter is it's done. Well, then they don't have much of a system. <laughs> you know, um, here, here, here's, here's the thing. Uh, if you go back and you look at uh, you know, some of the books in the 1980s, in my book, Kaizen and so forth, they said there's two types of measures. There's a process measure. That means we got it done. And there's a results measure. That means we did it well. And, and, and so just done is not really done. So uh, I have a lot of people say, you know, I got my black belt project done. I, I finished control. They wrote it off. And I said, has it been implemented? You know, did you, you serve as an advisor to the people because they didn't understand what to do? You know, so so when we, we implemented Six Sigma in Toshiba, uh, we did 7,700 black belt projects in 18 months. And the only way we counted them was after implementation. So, so if, if you did the analysis and you had recommendations and management approved it, the project's not done. It's only done once it's been executed. So it was execution excellence was really what we were looking for. And I think that's the, this critical thing. Just because your project gets done does not mean it was done right or that you got the benefit out of it. It, it, it would seem like if, if you wait until you've implemented and you look at what happened, much of the learning takes place there, right? Yeah, from what I'm hearing you say, the, the, you, you know, you, you got to finish it and see what happened. And, and okay. you also have to have a, a measurement system of daily work to know, did you actually change it? That's why having a baseline is so important. And, and having a standard baseline across all processes so that you can integrate across them and see how does the flow really go. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of people make a mistake with, with – doing balance scorecards, whatever they want to call it, that what they do is they let everybody choose their own measures. And, and measures don't flow across processes then. 
So, so you have to have a measure, uh, a fundamental measure. Toyota uses time, and I think that's the best measure. Uh, because if, if you're using cycle time, you can see the flow. If cycle time is taking too long, there's a reason, lack of motivation, lack of quality, uh, inconsistent parts or something, you can figure out what the cause is. Uh, and you can then calculate the cost of that lack of flow. So, so basically in, in a production system, uh, or even for whether it's service or, or hard good, durable goods production, flow and, and time is actually an adequate a proxy measure for the whole system. And that's, I think, uh, one of the key lessons that comes out of lean, is that a time-based measurement system is a good thing to have. Okay, so I've got a, I've got a two-parter here. It comes from two different people. One question is, uh, I'm worried about the degree of authority of this managerial engineer. Could you comment on this? But the second one was, what are the good traits of a managerial engineer? I think those two kind of go together. What do you think? Okay. Well, the authority, if, if you're going to be talking about somebody who is a trusted advisor to the senior management team, we're not talking about uh, a quality engineer. Uh, we're talking about a senior quality manager in the organization, somebody who is, you might call them the CQO, chief quality officer. Uh, you're talking about a leadership position, somebody who has grown up over time, so they actually have good experience. They understand the executive team. They've proven themselves in the past as a good analyst. Uh, as someone that, that has good understanding, good reasoning skills, they have good critical judgment, and, and that somebody who can get the people uh, really excited uh, about things. So, so motivation is stimulating people's desire to work, and, and, and that's, that's all of those are critical ingredients. So when we're talking about a managerial engineer, we're actually talking about a senior level position in a quality community, uh, or, or whatever community it is, but it's it's not a junior level job. You can't just say, okay, I'm, I'm out of university. I'm going to become a managerial engineer. Uh, it's kind of like when I uh, first uh, got out of a job and I, uh, I mean, I, I got out of uh, university and I was drafted. I had six months to find a job and I, I, I walked to some job interview. And I said, I want to be an investment banker. And they just looked at me and laughed. <laughs> so you know, let's do that right out of school, you know, no matter what you want to do. But this is the sort of thing we can, we can use this as a place to aspire to. So, so how do we get to be there? We get there by doing lots of projects and understanding them, finding them in different areas. We can build our flexibility and thinking about the organization. The hardest thing to develop in any human being is a general manager's mindset, where you can understand how all of those different functions work independently and collaboratively. And, and, and that is, I think, the, the critical success factor for this person, is that they can understand the whole system operations and then be able to work at that level. Okay, so one final question uh, about, uh, it's an ISO 9001. Are external standards like ISO 9001 a suitable standard to start with, or are there other standards to apply as a starting point? Uh, ISO 9001 is not suitable. Okay. So ISO 9001 doesn't tell you to do anything. Now, it doesn't tell you what you do. It just says document this process and so forth. It doesn't tell you anything about the content of work. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about the content of work. And, and that's the most important thing, is, is what is the content of what goes into standard work. So, so ISO 9000 talks about things that go into a quality management system. And, and that's not what the worker deals with, that's what the, the quality professionals are putting together. What the worker deals with is my standard work is I put this together in this way, and, and then I'm going to check my work doing this, and I keep these records, I put the data here, and so forth. So it's the detailed content of what's happening. That's the standard work. Okay. 